Thus far, we've looked at the introduction to the course, and we've also looked at the process of data mining. And one of the first steps in the process of data mining is data exploration. That is, what we are saying is that in data mining, we usually have lots of data, which is simply a byproduct of any organization conducting its business. So it's not as if the data is being gathered with a specific intent of extracting intelligence. The data was being gathered simply because the organization needs it to conduct business. So for example, you're selling some products, you obviously have to record the sales orders so that you can ship those kinds of things, right? So most of the time, business intelligence is conducted on data that is simply gathered for the day-to-day -day operations of a business. So we've got lots of data. And the first step is for us to explore the data and get our hands around the data to understand a little bit about the data so that we can then think of what kinds of analyses we may perform on the data. And this is called data exploration or exploratory data analysis. One of the things that we would like to first perform when we get a large data file is to simply summarize the data. Now, what exactly are we trying to do when we say we want to summarize the data? Think of data as this unorganized, amorphous bunch of things. So you've got a lot of data. You don't have much of an understanding of what is in the data. What can I do with this? So the first thing is for us to get a handle on the data, right? So rather than this amorphous, unorganized, ununderstandable mess, we want to get a handle on the data so that we have some understanding of what this data is all about. So it's not some disorganized mess, but we have a better understanding of it. So what we're really trying to do is to get a handle on the data at this point. So one of the things that we would be doing there is to first find out averages of the data. Okay, when we say averages, of course, we are being somewhat loose. In statistics, they usually talk about measures of central tendency. Okay, so that is we want to talk about uh, what is the typical representative of this data? What does it look like? And of course, the most common measure of central tendency is the average or the mean, which is, as we know, you add up all the values. Of course, you're talking about numerical values in this case. So you add up all the values and divide by the total number of values. That gives us the average. But although average is most commonly used measure of central tendency, it need not be the best one. Another important measure of central tendency is the median, which is not just the average, but the value that falls in the midpoint of the entire scale. In other words, what we are talking about is you've got a whole range of values from the minimum all the way to the maximum. Okay, What is the value that falls right in the middle? Not in terms of middle of minimum and maximum, that is maximum minus minimum divided by two. No, that's not what we are talking about. We are talking about, suppose we arrange all the available data in order, sorted in order. So for example, let's say we have a, a class of students and they've got uh, you've got the heights of all these students. Let's take all these heights, arrange them from the lowest to the highest, and then take the middle value. That's what is a median. Median is the middle value of a set of numerical values. And the median is many times a much better indicator of central tendency than the averages. Another value that is often used is the mode, and mode is simply the most frequently occurring value, the most frequently occurring value, which might also be important for us to consider a typical member of a group of data. Okay, so these are all different measures of central tendency. Let's try to understand a little bit more about what each means. Let's say you've got a conference room full of people, and uh, let's say there are 100 people in that room, and the average income, average annual income of the people there is, let's say, $100,000 per year. Okay, so that's the data that you have, and uh, we want to find out if this is a really truly representative or useful bit of information, that is the average. Now let's say in walks some very rich person like Bill Gates, whose average annual income 
probably runs into several hundred millions of dollars. Okay, now what happened to the average? The average shot up, shot through the roof. Because even though there were 100 people, each earning on the average 100,000, if you've got somebody who walks in and who's got uh, several hundreds of millions of dollars of annual income, then the average really goes through the roof. And it's completely dominated by the salary of one single individual. So in this case, the average annual income of the people in the room, assuming including the new person who's just walked in, is not at all a representative number of the typical person in the room. The average would be representative if the group was fairly homogeneous, there was not too much of variation among the salaries. You know, some people were making, let's say, 120, some people were making 80. And so in that case, the 100,000 would be a good figure. But if you've got a lot of disparities, then the average is usually not a good measure of the representative data item. In these cases, the median is actually a much better indicator, right? So in this case, let's say of the first 100 people without the, the last person, without Bill Gates having walked in, the let's say the median was, uh, let's say, 101,000. Let's say that was the median, which is the average of the of the middle person if you organ, if you arrange all the data by in order. Okay. Now, the average, of course, we already know, shot up with the entry of Bill Gates. But what happened to the median with the entry of Bill Gates? Well, it just so happens that Bill Gates, even though his salary is several hundreds of millions of dollars a year, is just the 101st person in the group. Okay. So earlier, the middle person might have been... Uh, you know, the, with 1 to 100, the middle person would have been the 49th or the 50th person. Now, with the entry of Bill Gates, that is just going to shift by 1. That's it. There's no big change. And therefore, the median might not increase at all, or it might increase by a really small quantity. Okay. So in that sense, median is often a much better representative of the typical member or of the, uh, you know, average member of a group. Which is why you find that in government statistics, very often what is reported is the median number and not the mean value. That's very important. Here are some properties of the three measures of central tendency that we've just looked at. The mean, of course, we know is the numerical center of a group of values. And the sum of deviations from the mean is going to be zero. In other words, some values are going to be less than the mean, some values are going to be greater than the mean, for every value, if you find out the difference between that value and the mean, and if you add up all of these differences, then by definition, those values will become zero. That's just the way in which the mean is calculated. And as we've already seen, the mean is very sensitive to extreme values. The median, on the other hand, uses only the center values. That is, you order the data in ascending order and then take the middle value wherever that falls. And of course, sometimes there is no middle value because uh, what you have is uh, an even number of items. In that case, what you do is you take the two middle values and take their average. That is how the median is calculated in those cases. In any case, the median is not sensitive to extreme values. The mode, as we saw earlier, is simply the most frequently occurring value and it may not reflect the center at all. It just simply depends on which is the most frequent value. And of course, for mode, many different values are possible, right? So for example, you may have a data set of 100, uh, 100 heights. There may be several people. There may be five people who are five feet six. That may be the maximum uh, number of people in a particular height. And there may also be five people who are at five feet eight. So the mode is five feet six as well as five feet eight. You could have several modes in a given population. Now, a useful thing to do for preliminary data analysis is simply to use the data analysis tool pack in Excel. Right? Often we get data in the form of spreadsheets, and therefore, uh, given that we are all used to using spreadsheets quite a bit, might be a good idea for us to just do preliminary analysis using our spreadsheet package itself. Excel has a reasonably useful uh, feature called the data analysis tool pack. 
And the data analysis tool pack is located in the data tab of Excel. So you see the data tab here. And that is where the data analysis tool pack is, is usually present. By default, when Excel is installed, the data analysis tool pack is actually not installed. So there's a good likelihood that when you click on the data tab, you do not see the data analysis uh, tool pack at all. So in that case, it's easy to install it. Uh, another point is that in older versions of Excel for Mac, the analysis tool pack was present. But now for whatever reason, it's not there anymore. So if you have, let's say, Excel for Mac 2011, or perhaps even 2010, I'm not sure about that. So if you have that version of Excel for Mac, then uh, not only is the data analysis tool pack not present, but it is not even provided, right? Whereas with Excel for Windows, by default, you won't see it, but it's a simple matter to install it. To, it's just an add-in that can be installed, as I'll show you shortly. So if you're going to be using Excel for Mac, then there's another alternative that I'll suggest. Not a great alternative, but we'll talk about that shortly. So to install the data analysis tool, analysis tool pack in 2000, Excel 2010 or Excel 2011, go to your file menu and then click on info. Uh, sorry, no, don't click on info. Go to the file menu and click on options. And then that is going to present this screen to you. And you see there's an item here called add-ins. Select that. That'll bring you to a resulting window and towards the bottom left of that window, you'll see this region that says manage. And then uh, there's a drop down in which by default Excel add-ins would be selected. So what you want to do is to uh, just click go. Or if Excel add-ins is not selected, then you want to drop down that list, select Excel add-ins and then click go. So once you do that, that will perform the installation of the Excel add-ins. In fact, it will come out with a window uh, with a dialog that shows several options. Uh, one of the options will be analysis tool pack and you could select the others too if you want. But for now, all we really want is the analysis tool pack. Check that and say, okay. And that is going to install the data analysis tool pack. And after doing this, if you go to the data tab, you will see the data analysis button on the right hand side. So Excel Mac older versions, as I've already said, under tools add-ins, you could go there and then you'll be able to uh, install the analysis data analysis tool pack. Uh, but with Mac 2011, they've discontinued this. Uh, but there is another product called Stat Plus for Mac. And that does some of the things that the analysis tool pack used to do. It doesn't do everything. It's a little bit clunky to use it. But if you really would like to continue using Mac, Excel for Mac for these things, you could use that. Of course, uh, in this course, I'll be showing you, especially in this lecture, a lot of things you could do within Excel. If you're using Excel for Mac, uh, you might try out some of the things or you might just, you know, you, that doesn't mean that you have to do these things because whatever analysis we are doing within Excel, we will also be able to do that inside R. Okay, I'm just showing you all of these Excel things just to give you additional options, nothing more. So let's take a look at how to do data summaries with the analysis tool pack, with the Excel analysis tool pack. Okay, so once you click data, you're going to see the data analysis tab, uh, data analysis, uh, in the data tab, you're going to see the data analysis option. Click on that, it'll show you this window. Within this window, select descriptive statistics, click OK, and uh, you will then get a dialogue in which you can do various things. But before you do that, you will notice that in your uh, lab uh, portion of week three, I've put up some files. So for this exercise, use the file bostonhousing.xls, the bo XLSX, the Boston Housing Excel spreadsheet. Use that, and then you'll be able to do what I'm doing on the screen, the screenshots I'm showing you, you'll be able to carry that out as well. And of course, in the spirit of doing everything hands-on and being involved, rather than just passively listening, I strongly uh, suggest that you take a look at what I'm doing, stop the video, go ahead, do it for yourself, and don't just do it and see the screen, but do it actively. Take a look at what's going on, uh, try to make some sense of what you're seeing and so on, so that you your mind is processing the information as well. 
Okay, so you're going to use the file bostonhousing.xlsx for this. Okay, so you're going to choose descriptive statistics, click OK, and that's going to show you the basic summaries of the Boston housing data, right? So the Boston housing data set has 15 different variables, and what Excel is going to do is to provide you with the summary for each of those variables. As you can see here, for every variable, it shows the mean, and then it shows you the standard error. Okay, that we'll talk about that later. It shows the median, it shows the mode, and uh, sample, um, uh, you know, variance, standard deviation, and uh, kurtosis, skewness, range, minimum, maximum, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so you can take a look at this. You can do this and see that it's showing you quite a lot of summary information about each and every column in that data file. Uh, there's one small issue here. Of course, the variable chas, if you you've worked with this data set earlier in one of your hands-on exercises, you know that the variable chas is really a categorical variable. Zero means that the particular data item, that particular data observation was uh, doesn't represent a neighborhood that borders the Charles River and Chas equals one means it represents a neighborhood that borders the Charles River, right? So really those zero and one values for that particular variable are not numerical, but actually they are categorical. However, Excel sees numbers and it does the summarization. Okay, in fact, even R will summarize it if it's zero and one. In fact, it will even summarize it even if you tell it that it's a categorical variable. Okay, so just a point as we look at this, we have to be careful. We can't just blindly be looking at numbers. We have to know what they mean. So that's why I just wanted to point this out. Okay. In, in R, you could also do the data summary. Uh, I'll be showing you how to do it in plain old R by typing commands. We'll also look at how to do this within R Commander. And then we'll also look at how to do this within Rattle. So we'll have several options. Uh, now, while I'm doing the hands-on, might be a good idea for you to try out everything. But when you are performing your analysis, you could decide which particular tool to use, or you could try multiple tools. I'm just showing you all the options that are available. Okay. So first of all, again, what you want to do is to read the data into R. Uh, now, R is capable of reading Excel files, but uh, I'm not deliberately using Excel files in R. Instead, I'll just be using the comma-separated variables in R. Okay. So the first thing you want to do is, of course, start up R, and then you want to read the file bostonhousing.csv this time. On Blackboard, I've posted both the Excel, XLSX file and the CSV file. So you want to use the CSV file for this. So you want to say read.csv bostonhousing.csv. And of course, before you do this, you have to make sure that you've set your default directory to wherever you've downloaded the file. Okay. Again, I've explained this in the first hands-on how to set your default directory, right? So you do within R, you do file, change directory, and then you specify a particular directory. If you're using Mac, I've also shown you in the first hands-on how to set the default directory for Mac. In fact, for Mac, you can set it once and for all and forget about it. Uh, in fact, even for uh, Windows, you could do that if you take your shortcut on the desktop and change the directory once again, I refer you back to the first lab that we did. Okay, so this is something we have done. Uh, so you read the file first, and I'm storing the results, whatever has been read in from the file, into a variable called hData. Of course, we could have called the variable anything we want. It's just a variable name. Uh, I'm just calling it hData for housing data. And then once you do that, after that, you can just say summary, and within parentheses, type in the variable name that you typed earlier. Now remember, R is case sensitive, so you have to type the variable name exactly as you had typed it earlier. If you change the case, then R will not realize it. Another important thing is whenever you're using a system which is command-based, you type in a command, and if you don't see what you're expecting to see, read the error message that it gives. Often, these programs will give you reasonable error messages and from those, you'll be able to figure out what mistake you made. So for example, if you type in a variable that was uh, that was different from what you'd use. So for example, I, I wrote H data all in lowercase here. Suppose I went and typed H in uppercase, summary H data with H uppercase. 
then obviously that's a different variable and R is going to not like it. But what it will tell me is something. It will tell me and give me an error message that says I couldn't find this variable. Okay, then of course I'll take one look at that and I'll know, okay, I made a mistake in typing it and I can correct it. Okay, so whenever you get an error, don't just, you know, throw up your arms and collapse. Instead, read the error message, try to make some sense of it. Okay, so once you type summary H data, and R is going to give you a summary of all the columns in that file. Okay, but the summary that R gives is a little bit different from the summary that, that Excel gave. Excel gave a lot of different values. R only gives minimum, uh, first quartile, median, mean, third quartile, maximum. Okay, of course you understand mean, you understand minimum and maximum. The other things we'll talk about shortly, meaning what are the first quartile, you also understand median, but what is the third quartile, we'll talk about those. Okay, so this is how you get data summaries with R, with raw R. Okay, once again, Charles River is, uh, you know, Chas is a categorical variable, right? But we haven't told R about the fact that this is a categorical variable yet, right? We just read in data and by default, it's numeric, so R assumes it's a number. And therefore, for now, it's treating it simply as a numerical variable. Once again, just like Excel did. Shortly, we'll see how to get rid of, uh, to solve this particular problem. So let's take a small look at a demo for data summaries within R. I'll just carry out the steps. It's not very difficult. 